Hi everyone, we are here at Animal Con in Orlando, Florida. We've got Neptune the Chameleon and Chameleon Academy here with Bill Strand. Hello everybody. <laughs> We're gonna get into some chameleon questions and discuss all things chameleon. So without further ado, let's get into the video. All right. All right, first things first, can you just give a quick rundown who you are, what you do, and why you're here? My name is Bill Strand. I run the Chameleon Academy, which is a multimedia outreach. Uh, it has taken many forms over the last many, many years, from uh, uh, Yahoo group listservs, to forums, to Facebook, to websites, podcast, video, and I've even tried TikTok. Yeah, TikTok's a, a special place. <laughs> <laughs> Very special place. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. So let's get into the questions now that everyone knows who you are. First things first, what is one of the best changes you've seen the chameleon hobby make since you started? First off, when did you start? Uh, that would probably, I think it was 1980. It, it was when I was a very young tyke. A kid. When, when dinosaurs roam the land. Uh, yeah, so I <laughs> had a lot to choose from and run from. But uh, yeah, it, uh, seventh grade, I got my first chameleon and I, I knew at that point that was it. I mean, you believe in love at first sight. Uh, at least it happened with me and chameleons. Yes, Guil guilty as well. For, only took one. Yes. Uh, so, so that being said, you've always seen the chameleon hobby changed throughout the years. So what are, again, what are some of the, the positives, great things that you've seen change throughout the years? Uh, the w most wonderful thing is that I have seen the evolution of our community and we have grown over the years. Uh, really when I started, they were known as the six month old, uh, six month lizard because you could only keep them alive for six months. And so uh, the whole community, we worked very hard at figuring out how to keep them alive just a couple of years. And then we had to figure out how to breed them. And, and I remember when I bred the my first panther chameleon, it was a huge accomplishment. When I bred uh, my panther chameleon to the second generation, huge accomplishment. I mean, now uh, that's just, everybody does it because we know how to do it, but we had to go through that, that those stages. And I think the, the most exciting thing about the chameleon community and the changes is that we've come so far that we are now working on how do we give our chameleons the best life and i think that's that's the most exciting thing uh, that i can uh, that i can see about the chameleon absolutely do you think there was one particular and obviously it's a series of changes throughout the years lots of trial and error but i know at one point we were in horizontal glass aquariums then screen enclosures we were using compact uvbs now we're on t5 so do you think there's any moment of along the husbandry specifically where you saw a drastic spike in life expectancy because of husbandry changes oh um i will say that the first the spike that we saw was when we started to use screen cages. And this is why the community has uh, held on to the screen cage with a death grip and won't let go. It's because there was such a dramatic change in our success since we started use, using screen cages. Now, it's a little bit more difficult for me uh, to, I knew I, I'd done a lot of talking about the differences between screen cages and hybrid cages and glass cages. And it's important that we understand why the glass cages before weren't working. Why did the screen cage work? And then taking a step back and realizing, okay, we may know that screen cages helped us so much, but when you look at Europe, they didn't go to screen cages. Right. They had incredible success and they were having solid side cages. And so that begs the question, what's really going on here? Was it really the screen cage or was it something a little bit bigger picture? And the answer of course is it's a little bit bigger picture. The screen cage made such an incredible difference because we're comparing it to an aquarium. Right, I think it really comes down to the size. At least that's been my observation, is people who struggle with glass enclosures are using a 12 inch, 24 inch glass enclosure and you don't have a lot of space 
to work with to provide the correct gradients, the space that the chameleons need, versus the screen enclosures are a lot more accessible, a lot more affordable, and are significantly larger, allowing us to have the wiggle room and play area to give the chameleons the parameters that they need. I don't know of anyone who's currently making a four foot tall glass enclosure <laughs> in, in the US, right? Not commercially, that you can get it uh, for custom made. But just to throw a little uh, wrench in the works there, uh, back in the 90s, there was somebody who was uh, su successfully breeding carpet chameleons and they used only glass aquariums. And so that tells us there's more to the story and we need to understand why he was successful when other people weren't. And learning why he was successful, other people weren't, why the Europeans were successful and they were doing without screen cages. Once we start answering those questions, we get a better understanding of caging as a whole. Absolutely. So going on the other side of it, we still have things to work on, right? We've, we've made leaps and bounds, great improvements. But what do you think are some gaps and improvements still needed for the chameleon community? I think that is going to be a, it's just going to be a lifetime thing for us is to constantly get better. I think the... What do you think are those areas that still need to get better? Things that come for me are, you know, enclosure size, right? Or hydration. A lot of people struggle with how do you deal with all of the water? Are we doing it the best way possible? So do you see things that you're actively thinking, hey, that area in particular, when it comes to our husbandry, care, breeding, whatever, still needs attention? I will say we still know very little about nutrition. We, you know, you go on social media and we talk as though we know stuff, but we really don't. And the things that we talk about as if they are fact, like it should be uh, two parts calcium to one part phosphorus uh, and, and such like that, where did we get that? Well, we got that from human medicine. And when's the last time that was challenged in human medicine? And so we are basing so much of what we think we quote know on things that haven't been reevaluated in decades. And, and that's throughout the entire nutrition. All of our supplementation, none of that is made for chameleons. It's made for, I mean, what? Uh, Zoomed made the Reptivite for tortoises. And we co-opted it for chameleons. And, but that's, that's what we have to do. And so I, I think that's a huge area for growth uh, is for figuring out what it really means. Uh, the other area for growth of us, uh, for us in the chameleon community is to let go of some of the baggage of the past. The things that we were very comfortable in saying we quote knew, we need to start evaluating and challenging those things as a general community. Just because it's working doesn't mean it's the best thing we could be doing. And the thing is, there's so much of that we've already gone through. And it's more of more the community accepting the new thought on it, like screen cages. So many people still are saying it has to be a screen cage. You look at some of those uh, care sheets that are running around out there. It has to be a screen cage. We have known that it didn't, doesn't have to be a screen cage. And in most cases, screen cage is not the best cage type. That information is out there. It's been out there. They have, there have been some uh, uh, high level advanced keepers who have been talking about how we need to change that for a long time, even before I started the Chameleon Academy podcast. And so there is a lot of catch up that a great deal of the community needs to do. So yeah, it, I, I think there's, uh, I, guess, I guess that's the way to say it. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, we have to adopt a growth mindset, right? And recognize there's more than one way to successfully keep a chameleon. And I love that we've been able to increase their life expectancy and we have found ways Yes, this is a way to be successful, but at the end of the day, is this the best way, right? So I think that's where, where things come in. Yeah. A lot of people get comfortable. They say, okay, I've kept my chameleon for five years. I've accepted that that is going to be a, uh, that, that, that is acceptable. It's longer than they live in the wild. I'm done. Why do I need to go forward? Why do I need to challenge what I am doing? There's no reason to. And so 
Uh, that comfort with where we are right now, uh, I, I, I would encourage you to uh, accept that we didn't know it all 15 years ago. And we still don't, right? <laughs> no, we still don't know it all. And we still have so much to go. I mean, if you're talking about the things I'd like to I'd like to look at. I mean, I can I can give you a list. That's of that. another video. <laughs> my I, my hope is while the textbook answer is five to seven years, right, for a, a veiled or panther, the dream is that's no longer our textbook answer, right? That we can say ten plus years, but hopefully we can get there. Uh, it, yeah, and uh, the reason why we're pushing to ten years is not because we just pulled that number out of the air. It's because we've seen chameleons live that long. And so it's not like we're trying to push them to live to 20 years and 30 years. It's we know that they can. And if we know that they can, then that begs the question, why are most of them not reaching that level? Is that truly an outlier or is there something better that we can do? And I think there's a responsibility that we have. If we can do better, we should. Yeah, if Neptune could live forever, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so on that note, what is the future of chameleon keeping? I know that's very vague, very big, but if we're looking you know, in the next five years, 10 years, just at a very high level, what would you like to see? Where do you think we're going? I think we are going to go to a, uh, a focus on the environment that the chameleon is in. Now, uh, I've said a while, we don't wanna just wrap a cage around a chameleon, we wanna create an environment for the chameleon to live in. And I see that taking a, a more substantial interpretation instead of just, okay, I've got all of my microclimates to the point where I've got more than the minimum of microclimates. I am creating a, an environment that's bigger than the minimum. And I am doing it because I enjoy the environment that the chameleon lives in. And this is, What's encouraging is that I'm seeing that people are uh, really embracing that. And it's like, I call it the TikTok generation <laughs> because I've seen so many of the new creators and the, the people who are starting chameleons now, they don't have the baggage of the past. And I, I will say my generation, and I realize this in myself, I have the baggage from way back when I tried, we were, we were all trying so hard just to keep chameleons alive. And that, that affects your mindset. And so I need to work to get out of that scarcity mindset and realize, you know, it's okay, we're past that. Yep. But the people who are starting right now, they don't have that. They are starting saying, okay, what is the best husbandry? And they just start with that. They don't yes, have yeah. to prove uh, they're not fighting against fogging. They're not fighting against hybrid cages. And it's, uh, I am amazed at how quickly they are advancing because they're not starting at 15 year old husbandry. A thing I like to hear all the time is not surviving, but thriving, right? There's more than just keeping a chameleon alive. That is no longer the determining factor of success. Just because they're alive does not mean they're living their best life. And I think that's a mindset I've adopted, other people have adopted, and it speaks to what you're you're talking to, right? The bioactive enclosures, the larger enclosure sizes, naturalistic hydration, those are all efforts being made to go into thriving, not just what you're saying, the previous years where it was just surviving. Yeah. Now the complication with that is what is thriving? And you will uh, you will hear people say it shouldn't just survive, they need to thrive. And people saying that are sitting there keeping their chameleons in these minimalistic cages, plastic plants and paper towels at the bottom and saying, oh, my chameleon's thriving. And so it's a highly subjective thing that is, I think that statement has no longer, it's no longer, it's sometimes not used as a personal challenge, but as a, uh, a club to hit other people over the head when they're not really evaluating what they are doing. Okay, that, that, I can see that too. <laughs> One more question yes. on this topic, the big juicy one. Do you have any regrets when it comes to your own personal chameleon journey? And potentially, are there any lessons you would like to share with anyone watching? You know, it's one of those like, say what I do, or what is it? Say what I say. I do what I say, not what, not I, what do. I do. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, 
So this is a difficult question. There's definitely mistakes that I made, things that I've learned from. The problem is, of course, if I <clears throat> didn't make those mistakes, I wouldn't have the lessons to pass on so it's very hard for me to say that i have regrets i've certainly had mistakes and i certainly had dead ends and disasters uh but unfortunately but now they made me what i am and i'm able to draw on that to create the podcast from the chameleon community and it's a deep insight into all of the other mistakes that other people could make and so uh, unfortunately, I think that speaks to your, your slogan though, right? Learn, understand, and pass, pass it, it on, on. right? Yeah. And I think maybe a step before that is maybe make a mistake, yeah. then learn, <laughs> then understand, then, then, then pass on. But that's part of the journey though. It's unrealistic to think that even if you do, to your point, the people who are just starting out have oodles of research, have great products and resources available to them. It's unrealistic to think there's not a certain point where mistakes will be made, pitfalls will happen. but your point learn understand and then hopefully move forward yeah. so if we're gonna maybe not make it so philosophical and just talk about opportunities lost perhaps because i didn't know the future uh, at one point i was keeping brachesia paramata which is also called the armored chameleon it's a small chameleon from madagascar and i considered at the time focusing on paramata and saying okay that's going to be my project i'm going to just uh, get a large breeding group and I'm going to focus on this one. In the end, there were other things that I ended up doing. And very soon after that, Brachesia paramata became the only chameleon to be included on CITES Appendix 1, meaning there would be absolutely no trade whatsoever. It would never come in again. And so that was an opportunity lost. I actually reproduced paramata. They're the cutest things ever. But now I only have, have photographs and the chameleon is lost to herpetoculture. Yeah, but I feel like that's still, I mean, obviously I would have loved to see them continue, but what a cool experience knowing that you got to experience this yeah. full life cycle, right? From egg yep, to yep. death, knowing that you are one of the few in the world likely that will be able to experience that. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a special experience. But Bit, no bittersweet. It's a regret, yeah, because uh, I was able to reproduce it, and so I could have reproduced it if I got the entire breeding colony that I was thinking about doing. It, I mean, we may still have it today. Absolutely. Okay, so shifting gears, you're a chameleon content creator. I'm a chameleon content creator. It's been pretty cool, actually, for both of us being at Animal Con because I think we're the only two chameleon content yes. creators <laughs> in the entire building. What is your favorite thing about a chameleon content creator specifically? My outreach is based on my personal growth. And that's the reason Chameleon Academy is in its eighth season. And uh, when I started, people said, how in the world are you gonna do a podcast on chameleons? Uh, how, how are you gonna do more than 10 episodes people say the same thing to me about videos and i've had i've over i think almost 400 on youtube and like, aren't you gonna run out of ideas and like just you wait <laughs> no I, I, and the thing is they're thinking about chameleons as okay you're going to go through the care sheet this is the temperature just humidity they don't realize chameleons are just a conduit for learning about the entire world and, and so, but the greatest thing about being a chameleon content creator is uh, that it is a vehicle for my personal growth. If I have a show, I am able to bring people on that can answer the questions I want to know. I know, that's, that's a nice little perk for you, right? <laughs> I have had over 100 people come on to my show and every one of them has a different perspective. And so uh, it could be every week, I am challenging what I think I know. I'm bringing on people that know more about something than I do, and I learn from them. And so it is a, an incredible growth opportunity. Uh, when I started the podcast, I was saying, and almost 40 years of experience. I mean, that's a long time working with chameleons. But since I've had the podcast, it has been a greater growth experience than the many decades before. 
because I'm constantly challenging what I think I know. It's not about me just saying this is what it is because of my experience. No, it's this is what I'm wondering and let's challenge it together. And I just bring along everybody with me. And so everybody can learn and grow along with me. And from the entire Chameleon community, we are so grateful and thankful that you do bring us along side of it because nothing's saying you couldn't ask those questions on your own time, right? In a, in a private room, right? And you get the information oh, and yeah. you're like, thanks, have a nice day. So again, thank you so much from all of us for being able to share that for the rest of the community to be able to enjoy, consume, and hopefully we can learn alongside you. You're very welcome. And I have to thank, thank you all because since you all watch my show, people are willing to come on. And so it's like a win-win a for us all. It truly is a community, right? Yeah, yeah, it has to be, it has to be. Uh, although I will admit, making all those contacts, that means I can ask questions in private and uh, it's kind of nice. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of being a chameleon content creator specifically is being able to help people, right? It, we're not necessarily in the business for entertainment and Bill and I have seen this entire weekend, different content creators of different right. sizes doing different animals and everyone's like, well, if you branched outside chameleons, then you could get you know more views or a bigger reach. I'm like, but that's not why I yeah. do this. I love the challenge of being able to talk just about chameleons with other people and making sure they understand how to be successful. And then hearing from you guys, like hearing the success stories, right? Of your three-year-old, five-year-old chameleon or your Petco rescue or, or whatever it was, like that's why I do this. And I think that's super special. And I think this is something very cool for our community that we have so much focus. And that is a benefit to the community because there is such a strong collection of information. And so I think that's a huge benefit for our community. Absolutely. So you and I have been doing the chameleon content thing for a few years now. So for anyone watching, for anyone who's interested in getting into chameleon content creation, do you have any tips or tricks or advice or things that you would recommend for them? Uh, first of all, I think it would be very valuable for other people to get involved. Uh, the there is not a monopoly here, right? Like <laughs> we are two people, so please <laughs> help yourself. Yeah, and it's, uh, the way it benefits the community is because when you're creating content, you have to think about it. And it's not so much of uh, chameleon herpetoculture is the art of it. Meaning you go out and you feel, okay, this should, this should be different because I just feel like it should be different. And, and that's true. I mean, that's, we all get a feeling for it, but when you become a content creator, you have to figure out how am I going to present this? How am I going to put this into words? And in doing so, not only do you help your own personal growth, but you're helping other people grow to that level and be able to uh, have those, uh, not necessarily the feeling of it, but they can get up to that level. And so uh, it's, I think it's valuable for more people to get involved in doing this. And uh, my, my advice to you is number one, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to call yourself an expert or feel you're an expert. If you are just starting off, that's fine. Make a YouTube channel, TikTok, Instagram, whatever, about you starting off and you growing. You uh, you researching it. Uh, bring people on if you need to. Don't pretend you're something you're not. Don't feel like you have to say, I'm an expert. And don't come on and start teaching people things that you don't really understand. It's called the imposter syndrome, where you feel where you, if you pretend you're something, you have to keep that up. And it's right. an amazing amount of stress. And with great power comes great responsibility, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. the wise words of Uncle Ben. But I think when you have a platform, you do have a responsibility yeah, because people will follow your advice. So exactly what you're saying, if you're not the point in your care and your chameleon journey where you feel comfortable and confident with your care to be able to give people specific advice or answer their health issues, that's okay. Don't do it. Don't pretend to be something you're not. There's excellent, you know, care guides out there or other care videos or other resources that you can happily point people to. Don't feel pressured to have to imitate what you've already seen and find your voice, your thing and go from there. Yeah. Right now, there's so much information out there that it's a skill to develop, to be able to sort through it all. And so, lots of time, lots of time. <laughs> and so that's a valuable skill that you can share with your audience. 
So one other tip I would have for anyone wanting to get into chameleon content creation is consistency. And I think both you and I have firsthand experience in that, that the chameleon hobby is small but powerful, right? So if you're doing it well, you will see momentum, you will build an audience over time, but it's not going to be an overnight sensation as if it would be for, say, geckos or snakes or other reptiles that just organically have a larger following. So I think at the end of the day, if this is something you are passionate about, if you enjoy, if you enjoy media, whatever, long form, short form, TikTok, YouTube, just be consistent with it and remind, remind yourself why you're doing it in the first place. I would say figure out what you're good at. If uh, some people are going to be good at short form video, some people long form video. Uh, I am excellent at podcasts for better or for worse. You are excellent at TikToks for better. <laughs> and so, or worse. <laughs> so uh, when you're at least when you're starting out and trying to build up your your outreach, uh, figure out what you're good at. I mean, even if you're excellent at writing the, the Google algorithm, is still a powerful tool. It doesn't get the uh, attention it deserves because social media is so flashy and you get such immediate results. And so there's a lot of attention there, but uh, you can create a blog and be successful. Yeah, there are some questionable blogs out there on Chameleon Care, so we could use some, <laughs> we could use some good ones. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've stayed pretty vanilla so mm -hmm. far, but it wouldn't be an interview if we didn't get into some more dicey uh -oh. red button questions. So you get trouble. So you're a creator, I'm a creator, yep. you have a following, I have a following. You started first and I came in behind you. So I've heard many times, I read the comments for all you wondering, <laughs> and I've gotten comments accusing people, or people accusing me of being a copycat or just regurgitating things you're saying, no original thought. And while I absolutely admire you, look up to you, the, what was it, the Chameleon Breeder podcast yes, back in my started, day, yeah. right? Was actually how I got started. No one was doing videos. Yeah, it was just the forums and your amazing podcast. But I've been accused many, many times of, you know, copycat, all that. And here you are right in front of me. So do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I would say that the what I create with the Chameleon community is meant to be for everyone and for everyone to use. Uh, it is not stuff that I just created out of my head like an artist and is copyrighted Bill Strand. Uh, everything that I have on there has been a compilation of the community coming together and adding to it. I, uh, I, I won't diminish my role in it. Yes, I facilitate it and I provide the container for it, but all of that information is to be used by the community. All you new creators, this information is for you to use and it's and it's for Neptune to use and it's for me, everybody to use because it's the whole purpose of it is to move the uh, community forward. And I would say I am glad that you're using it and I am glad that you are using your talents to be able to spread it in areas that I am not that great at. I am not that great at TikTok, guys. And she's able to talk to the people on TikTok. If it wasn't for her, somebody else would be talking to the people on TikTok and who knows what kind of information they would be providing to the people on TikTok. So it is a good thing that she is using the latest of information. And so copying the latest information, that's not copying, that's taking the latest of information and it's uh, uh, interpreting it in her own style. So uh, I'd like to say we, we're not competing. Uh, the, the subscribers and followers and likes, it's not a zero sum game. You can follow us both. You can enjoy us both. We have very different styles and you can enjoy both of those styles. She is going to reach people that I can't because people are not going to sit. Some people are not going to sit and listen to 40 minutes of me going on about UV index uh, three and a screen at 70% transmission level. I'll, I'll listen to that. <laughs> uh, okay, she'll listen to that. But like she's able to talk to some people that aren't going to be listening to those kind of podcasts. That's where I excel. She's excelling where she excels in their different places. So I, we as a community, you need me. We need her. And so 
uh, I'd like to see let's uh, let's support each other in this. And so I, I just publicly say I, I'm glad that you're <laughs> using my information. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's not really my information. I am just facilitating its availability for the community. And that and that's what my intention is as well is to make that information easily accessible, easily understood so it's easily consumable for someone who's just getting started and maybe doesn't have the time or the base knowledge to dive into the more technical, deeper discussions that you have, right? How do we make it easy to consume? And honestly, how do we set people up for success? When you have a sick chameleon that you didn't realize was sick because you've had it for six months already, and so you're scrambling, trying to get the right supplies, the right information as quickly as possible just to keep your chameleon alive. You don't have the luxury of time. You have to have it be simple and easy to consume with the lowest margin for air. And I'd like to say, if anybody out there wants to be a uh, content creator and you want to use the information on the Chameleon Academy, please use it. I, I say, learn, understand, and pass it on. My whole point in the approach that I take to the Chameleon Academy is that I explain why you sh why these things I am saying are true. The whole point of the podcast is that you can grow along with me so you can see my sources as to why I am saying that. And all you have to do to piggyback off of that is to, uh, uh, is to communicate your sources. I mean, don't take something that I say and then just say it as if it's a fact because then someone's going to challenge you on it. And if you have said it as if it's your own, well, you're responsible for uh, answering that challenge. With great power comes great response, yeah. but it goes back to that. <laughs> but if you state your sources saying, I've been researching on Chameleon Academy, and then somebody challenges you on it, well, then they come to me. Uh, and I can tell you, I am up for that challenge. And so piggyback off of that, take advantage of that. I, I don't think I've ever seen Neptune not uh, talk uh, about Chameleon Academy as a source. And so I mean, that, that's fine. That's, that's how we use it. Now, don't necessarily take my graphics and then cut my logo off and pretend it's yours. That, that, that's not what we want to do, but the information is there for you. So please use it. Whenever I use one of your pictures, it always says Chameleon Academy yeah. right on the little bottom. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And then one of my favorite red button topics is the blanket statement, chameleons are advanced reptiles. I hear this all the time when I go to reptile expos and I'm like, hi, I'm Neptune the chameleon. I do all things chameleon. They're like, oh my gosh, I could never, like they die so easily. Props to you. Like I would never own a chameleon. They're so advanced or the thoughts of like, you need to get a bearded dragon or a gecko before you dare take on the challenge of a chameleon. I have my thoughts on, again, it's a very blanket statement. People toss this out mm -hmm. like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Chameleons are advanced reptiles. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that chameleons take a little bit of extra effort to set up and they take a little bit of extra research to set up. But the information is not only is it there easily available, but the information is actually easy to digest and execute. You just have to do it. And so I'd say they are in advanced in the way that it takes a modicum of effort to learn how to do it. It's not just intuitive, uh, it, but. But no different than any other reptile would be, or do you have different thoughts? Well, I actually don't like the idea that we say that other reptiles are simple. Uh, the bearded dragon, leopard gecko, crested gecko, they are all just as complex as chameleons in their life cycle and their needs. And we should be giving the same amount of attention to them. That's exactly what I said in a TikTok video I just oh, really? did. That we should not, okay, chameleons should not be advanced in the concept of beginner reptiles, I think needs to be absolutely disputed. All reptiles have supplementation, UVB, substrate, enclosure size, diet, nutrition. So you have to learn all those different facets. And a bearded dragon's care is completely different than a chameleon's care. And I'm sure some of you watching have beardies and chameleons and you're like, they are not similar at all. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable with the idea that bearded dragons should, or should be a beginner reptile because they can accept 
more improper husbandry. And that's what it is. The margin for error, I think, with chameleons is significantly smaller than other reptiles, which is why they're considered advanced versus a bearded dragon is maybe a little hardier. You can mess up a little more before it dies versus a chameleon. You can't mess up a lot before it dies. I think that over time has given them the reputation of being advanced. But in actuality, to your point, if you do it correctly from the beginning, follow the right, and that's honestly a big problem is there's so much wrong stuff out there that's hard to navigate. You think you're doing it right, but then you find out you haven't been this entire time. But if you do it right from the beginning, if you do the research, put in the time, put in the money, you will be successful. It's pretty easy. And and I will say, one thing I'll say is uh, there are, it's easy to get confused about all the chameleon information out there. There's a lot of different opinions, a lot of different approaches. Most of them work if you're taking the the information from somebody who actually keeps a chameleon. And there are ways that I disagree with, but if the person's actually keeping a chameleon, uh, chances are good. They're not gonna die in six months. Uh, The problem is when you take uh, care from these large organizations that just hired a marketing team to scour Google and put together a care sheet, uh, that's that's a little bit more dicey. But the uh, what uh, what we all recommend is getting a captive hatched uh, panther chameleon is the one that's uh, usually available, but to work with the breeder. And when you're working with the breeder, you do what that breeder tells you to do your breeder is going to uh, be an expert in how to get people started from ground zero because that's what they do. I know when you go on social media, it's uh, very complicated. And, and even you come to Chameleon Academy, it is it is overwhelming because I keep pushing us forward. That's my job. And I acknowledge sometimes that gets uh, a little bit complicated. And so don't feel bad if you don't understand everything that I'm talking about or implementing everything that I'm talking about. Start with what your breeder tells you. And that, that'll that get you going for the first year. Once you get your feet under you, you feel confident you've got it, well, then you can start adding in some of the more advanced and complicated and uh, more naturalistic type stuff. Yeah, my two cents, I don't think chameleons are advanced. And I always go as far as to say is they're very manageable. Once you get them set up, once you automate everything, maybe go as far as to say they're easy. But I know that is a, again, it is a hot topic, right? It's a red button, red button topic. But, you know, again, find the right information. Start from the beginning, set up, be set up for success, buy from a good breeder. There's tons of things that you can do to avoid those common pitfalls and be successful with a chameleon. Yep, yep. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for being on my YouTube channel. I hope you guys enjoyed some tips and tricks from the master himself, answer some questions. So thank you again so much. Where can people find you if they're interested in learning more about Chameleon Academy? Uh, Chameleonacademy.com. And if you're into podcasting, Chameleon Academy podcast and Panther Chameleon podcast. And uh, so, you know, uh, (laughs) Chameleonacademy.com is the central hub for what I do. Awesome. Well, if you guys enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Leave any questions or comments down below. Feel free to subscribe so you know when I post a new video, be sure to subscribe to Camila Academy. Always, thank you so much for watching. You can follow Neptune and all my chameleons on social media at Neptune the Chameleon. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day. Bye. Really, oh my gosh, my, my wait, wait a second.